first day, we brought the, the benefit of hearing from a restoration biologist with probably about 30 years of experience on looking at, assessing, and restoring fish habitat. I got to know Nick Leon a little bit as the planning work was coming together for this symposium. And I can tell you that there is a lot of knowledge around habitat resting uh, with this man that we're going to hear next. So, Nick, if you would like to step up and let's hear what you have to say about habitat restoration. Thank you very much. I hope folks can hear me. Is this too loud or is it about right? All right, I'm going to do my best job here. Ken said to keep it lively. I have the coveted position of coming in at the end, so they call me the closer, and that's probably going to be the truth. I'm glad you guys got up, got some, uh, got some blood flowing here, your blood sugar going. I also just want to take note that uh, Kim, I think, graciously added seven years to my retirement, which would have been absolutely wonderful. I would have taken that. I think he said 33 years with DFO. It's actually been 25, but I also have uh, 10 years stateside, so I'm really glad to see a couple of uh, compatriots uh, from the U.S. that are up here. They managed to get across the border wall, so that's a good sign. <laughs> very happy about that, and it's good to see them. And I just want to say, too, that for folks that were on the Dave Derrick workshop yesterday, it was a fantastic workshop up from Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I'll tell you, if you think, and folks have said to me, that they can tell where I'm from, well, trust me, I feel vindicated now, having uh, with Dave Barrick up here, and boy, you know where this gentleman's from. And uh, a really good speaker, and it was good to have you up here, Dave, and I think folks really appreciated it. So, uh, yes, my name is Nick Leone. I'm with Fisheries and Oceans Canada with the Salmonid Enhancement Program. And under that, we have two sections. We have our community involvement program, who is engaged with the community members, of which we saw earlier 40% are, are represented here, which is an excellent representation. And it's fantastic to see all of you here. And I just want to, as uh, Julie would say, a quick shout out as well to my colleagues that are here uh, in support of this initiative in their communities, to our community advisors throughout the South Coast area, and also colleagues from over in the uh, Lower Fraser Valley, so I just want to mention them. So a quick caveat here, um, and this is a little bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, I do apologize, you should never apologize up front, but I'm going to very quickly here. I wish I had kind of the, the real whizzy, kind of scientific and technical uh, backdrop and photogrammetry that we saw from some of the previous uh, presentations, but I don't. Uh, this is really kind of reflective thoughts uh, looking back uh, basically in time and then in and sense a bit of an analysis of the work that we've done over the past half dozen years and really reflecting a bit further beyond that certainly and it is actually a generation in fact several generations that we're that we're looking back and that will be the context the other caveat is this and I think you've seen a lot of that today is that there is very little new under the sun so the information I'm going to present is not for shadow not at all. But while that is the point, it shouldn't be taken in a sense, well, then why are we here? What are we doing? This is really a call looking forward. This is really to reflect on the very good work that has been undertaken over, the, over many years and to try and call upon that experience that we've had in the past in terms of moving forward. So with that, I'll start. I think one of the things that's really important is that it's important to note that this year is the International Year of the Salmon. This is an initiative, a joint initiative, of I believe it's the North Pacific, uh, North Pacific and Adventist Fisheries Commission and the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization. And they've identified this year as the Year of the Salmon. And how critical is that when we look at issues around climate change? And there were two principal goals of the International Year of the Salmon, and I just want to highlight them, and it's really the point that is highlighted in bold there. The International Year of the Salmon is an initiative to inform and stimulate outreach and research that aspires to establish the conditions necessary to ensure the resilience of salmon and people throughout the Northern Hemisphere. That is a very key point, because one of the things I want to point to here is 
It's not just about the fish, it's about us and our ability to adapt to change and resiliency. So it's not just the fish or the landscape. Secondly, another one of the key aspirations was to raise awareness of what humans can do to ensure salmon and their habitats are conserved and restored. Now this isn't entirely new, as I say, because very little actually is new. But what is really important here is that I think many in this room, many feel that salmon are a sentinel species, and they, they certainly are. They reflect a variety of the watershed values that we've been discussing over the course of this of today and in the field yesterday. There are three principal uh, objectives within, in, within the International Year of the Salmon, and I think they're important to, to point out. There's actually more than this, but I think these are the three that are perhaps most critical. To support the conservation and restoration strategies, to help manage salmon in the face of climate change. That's a large part of what we've been talking about today in terms of the response of the hydrologic cycle to changes or shifts in climate. And then accordingly, how the animals or organisms, ourselves included, respond to that. To inspire and support a new generation of researchers, managers, and conservations. So why is this important? Well, it's damn important because it is, in large part, all about people. And it's about replenishing in terms of the professions, the disciplines, the interests, the energy. And there's a lot of that in this room. It is very humbling, I will tell you, to stand before such a crowd as yourselves, recognizing the discipline, the depth of knowledge and passion that you have. And I truly feel honored to be doing that. And then thirdly, to help create a greater awareness of the ecological, social, cultural, and economic values of salmon. What I want to point to here is, again, it's not just about the organism. It's what that organism represents that is fundamentally important to, to why we're here and how we not only look at that animal, but how we look at the landscape. So, water is a driver. We've been hearing a lot about this all day today. So I'm going to try and be quick. I've asked, uh, or as quick as I can, I know that Peter has the bun bag back there, and I think he's going to have to go back to the bakery, perhaps, because uh, we'll see how it goes here. But water is a driver in terms of the, the connection between our atmosphere and climate. It also is a fundamental connection between the landscapes and the oceans. Now, I know this is all relatively intuitive, but it's really important to take a step and to reflect on the fundamental importance of what water means to us in our lives. It's the connection between fresh water and marine. It is fundamentally the connection through hydrology across time that you heard uh, Neil and Sylvia speaking to. And that is critically important from a salmon perspective, where they have a delicate and, and multi-stage life history, key of which is linked to the freshwater environment. When they go to the ocean, they return and they bring back nutrients to replenish that environment, that freshwater environment. Also through stream flow, it changes and the connection to channel form and the dynamics of what goes on in the channel and how we respond to that. Again, if you look at some of the slides today, I'm reflecting on the one that you'll show there on Bonnell Creek. You can see what happens when things become out of balance and some of the challenges. It is the connection between the habitat and the habitat diversity that is absolutely needed for these animals and many other organisms and uh, resources of value in our creek sheds. The connection between wildlife and fisheries People and communities, one of the reasons we're here is because we hold value in these key resources and, and our creek sheds. And then through that, through our community engagement, and again, it's very inspiring to see so many of you here and actively engaged, and not just now, but through time. Ultimately, land use that we've been talking about and is a real challenge, but on the other side of that coin is the restoration. You know, arguably, if we had no impacts on our creek sheds, there may not be a need to restore, to rehabilitate. But there is. There is fundamental realities. And we need resources, we need land to, to develop and to, to inform our communities, but also to engage within our communities. It is, in fact, a key driver, as you heard in talking about the Water Sustainability Act, between governance and policies. These are critical. I know I've spent a lifetime in this realm as well. One of the things I didn't mention 
Because while I'm tagged right now with being considered a resource restoration biologist, which is a habitat restoration, I come from 20 years experience and actually more uh, looking at the regulatory end and looking at land use planning and development. So my, my, my perspective on restoration is owned through that lens in part as well. And then finally between disciplines. And it's great to see a number of different uh, professional disciplines that are illustrated within uh, 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 the attendance here today and also the citizenry and the citizen science that are represented through our stream keepers groups. So, restoration, connecting with hydrology. Now, where's Neil? He's going to give me brief for this, but uh, I love the fact that when you posed the question about coho and uh, cutthroat to him, he completely went blank. So that, uh, that made me feel good. So, you know, we have something uh, that we can work together on. So in hydrology, the science of water and water cycle dynamics, I think you've gone through that uh, quite a bit today, but it is a core driver in understanding water dynamics. The hydrologic regime, when we talk about our watersheds, one of the first things we talk about, one of the first things we notice, if it goes dry, we're there, you're there, you see it, you know it. If it floods, we feel it, we see it, we know it. Well, I can tell you, if we see it, feel it, know it, Certainly, so can the fisheries and, and uh, its connection to other resource values. And it fundamentally helps to shape and influence our landscape. It forms a connection between ecosystems and habitats. And yes, there is a distinction. You heard of um, Domenico this morning uh, referring to that in terms of the management of the forest landscape and the variety of species. It influences channel form, vegetation patterns, the distribution of the riparian and hyperbaric zone, the introduction of large wood, uh, large wood and debris, the acronym there, and sediment delivery and transport. These are essential elements that we need to recognize and understand as a part of this dynamic landscape if we're even to have a possible chance of fundamentally helping to restore or rehabilitate our creek sheds. Now this is critical point here. I'm going to be referring back to this a little bit later. But from a fish perspective, fisheries perspective, water clearly influences the availability, the access, diversity, and complexity of habitats crucial to supporting the variable life history of salmon. And this is what makes salmon so unique. They have a very, a very fragile life history that includes both freshwater and marine, and several freshwater life history cycles that are very attuned to the landscape, but also the hydrology and the changes of hydrology. I would submit that historically, and this is general now, if you'll allow me, historically we have tended to look more on a site scale focus and on a single species per, uh, perspective in terms of what are the specific habitat requirements for coho, for, for chinook, for steelhead, for cutthroat trout. Traditionally, there was a somewhat more limited focus on the broader watershed conditions and the effects on hydrologic processes and related processes. It's not that we weren't aware, there was just less emphasis given to them in terms of developing repairing prescriptions for specific or single species. Build structures were often designed without meaningful or adequate reflection of the dynamic state of the environment. And I think as you can see through the present presentations today, that it is very dynamic. It is highly dynamic. And we need to really understand this when we're trying to come in and develop specific habitats that require some level of built infrastructure and to be able to sustain that over time if that's what we choose. This is a key one. We're going to be coming back to this. Expectations for immediate biological and sustained response our increase in our system productivity. Now, from a fisheries perspective, this is paramount. This is what we're all about. The simple premise is, if you build it, they will come. The simple premise is, or the general math, the greater the number of fish that we can put out, the greater number of fish that will return. Now, that's a great premise. It has worked from time to time, but it's, always, it's often failed us miserably. And there's many reasons for that. Never mind of which the challenges in the marine environment and the changes that are going on there. But certainly in the freshwater environment as well, 
Well, it's not rocket science, it's not dead simple either. And this is something that's been interesting too. Over the time of in-stream and fisheries habitat restoration, we have tended to move away from the main channel environment over to the off-channel. And off-channel is kind of the, uh, the key uh, a parameter that I think many folks look at in terms of trying to or striving to enhance uh, watersheds in terms of fisheries production. But one of the reasons we did that was because of the state of the main stem environments. They were highly degraded. They were very active. They were undergoing transformation for really which was the initial wave of development. And it wasn't just forestry. Forestry clearly is one of the most pervasive landscapes and or land uses and it tends to have a greater impact on the upper mid watersheds. But we all own it in terms of what we need, what we want, and how we live. So the agricultural sector, the urban development sector, our business sector, our industrial sector, all these things have an influence on the landscape. And so we moved to that area because the off channel, because we thought it was an environment that was not just simply easier to work in, but it was safer to to, to work at, and we felt that we could increase fish numbers utilizing those habitats. I think where we have started to go, certainly in more recent times, and I'll tell you this right now, it's an area where within our shop, so to speak, we are trying to move to, and it's not perfect, this is a time in transition, is a shift to a process-based focus, a broader ecosystem focus. Process restoration targets river dynamics that sustain the riverine ecosystem. These are thoughts and considerations of research that were supported by Tim Beachy and others of NOAA, of the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration and the Northwest Science Center, based on some core founding principles. One, the root causes of ecosystem target root causes of ecosystem change. Two, tailor restoration actions to local potential. In this case, they're referring to the actual biophysical potential and potential within a watershed, arguably even at a reach level. But I'm going to argue it even goes beyond that to talk about the potential of human beings to interact and try and influence the uh, rehabilitation of a creek shed. Match the scale of restoration to the scale of physical and biological processes. I think that's something that we've been generally aware of over time, and I'll speak to that a little bit later. And this is a key one. I've heard this come up in terms of expectations, in terms of setting objectives. Have we met it? Where are we at? How are we doing? Be explicit about expected outcomes. And I can tell you, this is critical when people hold so dear this particular resource in fisheries and expect they're going to get production numbers like this, and instead they get something much lower. We need to be realistic. This is a bit of a, a diagram that further reflects what I was just talking about in terms of a broader ecosystem. Process-based approach. This is from Philip Groning, also a colleague of Tim Beachy. This is out of Washington State. But it clearly illustrates the basic principles that we know and some of which we've seen earlier today. The landscape controls on the top, including geology, vegetation, climate, leading to the core watershed processes. This is the area where we really want to try and gain a better handle and to refocus our attention. And then leading from the watershed processes to the creation of specific habitats that support the uh, fisheries and the diversity of fisheries we have. It's not just single species, it's multi-species, and they need different habitats at different times, ultimately leading to biological response and that is typically some level of production, some level of, of community diversity. These are general indices that we use. A further illustration of that can be seen here when we talk about hydrologic connectivity. I think Neil and Sylvia showed a similar cartoon as this. Uh, if we look over on the left and we see our typical slice of our typical creek shed, how the, tri how the hydrology is uh, demonstrated across the landscape, what I like about this one is it talks about the elevation or gradient of systems, and that's very important from a fisheries perspective. It is critically important to understand that dynamic of the flow on the landscape if you're looking at undertaking habitat restoration for fish. If you're looking at undertaking restoration where certain built structures 
like a water intake, may be required. Because you see that change in that landscape. You see the issue of conductivity. It's longitudinal and it's horizontal. And then if we look over to the right, this just again illustrates kind of that same process as we look at hydrology as the key driver, helping to shape and influence the physical habitat environments that we focus on as fishery specialists. Also water quality, that cannot be forgotten, very critical, and leading to the biological communities uh, that we hold value in that are indices of a healthy community. So, from a fisheries perspective, and if I can, a uh, thin citric viewpoint, and at this point in time, I guess I'll display my adipose uh, fin, so you can see it in full display. You will note, though, if I talk about my adipose fin, and that's showing to you not only the interest in fishery, but I'm not of hatchery origin. I am wild stock. In any event, what we try and do is we look at integrating salmon stock priorities. And when I say salmon stock, I'm talking actual fisheries. These are, this is the production of fisheries, of fish, with those of the community interests. Obviously, many of, you, many of you in this room are interested in fish, interested in fisheries as an indicator of your environment, but also as another resource value, another ecological value that is imparts to our community. So that ultimately includes your interest in the landscape and water. Aligning stock enhancement approaches, stock enhancement, this is in habitat right now. So fish production with watershed system capacity. It was a question that was raised earlier today about carrying capacity as it relates to human beings and their impact on the landscape. Well, guess what? It absolutely relates when we're talking about fisheries and watershed. And that's what we're talking about here. So if we're looking to enhance fish production in a watershed through the support of our community hatcheries, we need to make sure that that production level is consistent with what that system would naturally produce or could hold. Integrating habitat status report. Now this is a long one. The habitat status report was a strategy that was uh, defined and identified under the wild salmon policy, which is now in its second revision as a policy. And it basically takes into account watershed condition, it looks at the biophysical state of a watershed, and it looks very importantly at land use. It looks at pressure and state indicators, and both of these are fundamentally important for understanding what's going on in our watershed. And then we utilize a risk, uh, risk management assessment process where we take that information and we go into the communities and through various workshops we gain their knowledge and experience both on watershed factors and conditions in that watershed but also from a more specific fisheries value perspective. And through that we look at the issue which in fisheries management and for fish restoration specialists, we love, we get into the weeds on this, limiting factors analysis. And it's a fancy term, and many of you probably know this, but basically it's a fancy term for looking at what are the production bottlenecks? At what life stage? Is it spawning? Is it incubation? When the animals are still in the gravel, they're alive, but they're in the gravel? Is it when they're frying? or when they're poor or small size, and they're ready, for salmon species anyway, to migrate into the marine environment. Very delicate life stages, finely tuned over thousands of years to look at minute changes and differences in response within our creek sheds. So we use that process to try and integrate those, those factors together to determine what may be possible, what types of restoration opportunities are possible. And I think one of the other objectives we look at is to try to seek to expand stakeholder audience beyond the traditional party interests. Why? To increase awareness and to better protect and conserve the fisheries ecosystem. Now, I, it's fantastic to see everyone here, but sometimes you feel like you're in church. And there was somebody I was mentioning to earlier today, we were talking about that. And it's great to speak about that. It's great to see the passion. But you know what? When we look at the challenges that we face today on a restorative end, we need to expand our audience base. 
We need to get to those who would otherwise have no concern, consideration, or care for salmon that many of you in this room hold dearly. And that is important to me as a fisheries biologist. That is important to me as a person who's looking at restoration of landscapes to support salmon as well as other resources. And that includes the transitioning of just taking a limiting factors view on a single species and moving that over to the paradigm of looking at the broader environment and one that will support a multitude of species. And sometimes, yes, there can be conflicts in that. I'll tell you that right now, in terms of multiple species. All right, so here's a little bit of an illustration or cartoon that talks about the limiting factors that's linked to watershed and hydrologic conditions. I'm going to focus your attention over on the right, and you'll see a little bit of an illustration here. It's time on the x-axis and y on the y-axis we have from the headwaters down to the ocean. That represents our creek shed. It represents the different environments in that creek shed. In the middle there, when you see the different colors, of which I can't see really fundamentally because I am reasonably colorblind, so this always poses a bit of a challenge, but I can read it. It shows you or illustrates the different life histories of salmon species. And, and it goes from literally times of hours up to a couple of years in which these animals at different life stages will spend in our creek sheds. And then obviously out to the ocean. For some species, they're only out in the ocean maybe a year, maybe two. For others, they're out in the ocean in marine environment for up to four years and generate a lot of marine biomass and bring that back in to replenish our systems. But look at the interplay of these specific life history factors within our environment. And look at the range of the environment on the y-axis. That's important. That's important to consider if we're looking at restoring habitat values in these watersheds. So ultimately, as we said before, the hydrology is linked to the landscape. The flows are generated through factors of climate and interplay of climate, weather, and elevation. Elevation is very important, not only to the specific habitat types and species, but also in terms of potential for water storage, which we desperately need now. Flows also help generate, are generated through gradient over, over, over the landscape and help to define our channel form. And not just in a single channel, sometimes in multiple channels. The connection to the riparian areas, the off-channel environments that are fundamentally important to so many species. Timing. We mentioned about timing of, of flows and the alteration based on a previous area and based on some of our integrated stormwater management plans. Well, I can tell you absolutely that the issue of timing of flow is fundamentally critical to these animals, and most of you know that. And particularly right now, we have a, num a number of fish that are beginning to smolt. They're already preparing to go out into the ocean, and uh, those on Shelly Creek are going to soon be putting in their fence and monitoring those if they haven't perhaps already. And yet, what do we have right now? We have very low flows, seasonal flows, what we would historically look at for this time of year. So it's something that we're going to have to watch for. And then ultimately flows linked to productivity. You can't have fish, you can't have numbers of fish without water. Here's the way I think that we're trying to go. Here's the way that we're trying to think more about this. This is the way that we would like to engage the broader community and the other entities and interests. And that is looking at this same diagram on the right, and the salmon life stages, the delicacy of that that I pointed to earlier. But it's taking it, if we look to the left, from the physical process side. Those core drivers that make up or are imparted within the landscape and help drive the physical habitats that we look at to conduct our limiting factors analysis for any given species. And then ultimately, even more specifically than that, to look at those micro features that are so important, whether it be depth, water clarity, water quality, cover, good gravel quality, all these aspects that are so critical to support each of these life stages. But I think where we are trying to go is to shift from strictly a fish or fin-centric perspective to one that hopefully we can gain a broader audience, and in so doing, expand that audience, get the energy that we need to help support uh, restorative development within our creek sheds. And at the same time, guess what? It's going to be of real value and benefit to fish. Not a single species, multiple species. 
So, if we can, illustrated examples of log structures. These are great. They serve a purpose. But they are site scale. They are, at times, reef scale. This is really important. But what you see about the diagram or the photo on the left is that wood is important to streams in our region. Fundamentally important for some miners. But we need to think bigger picture, so you shift over to the right. There's an environment that we need to look at. I was uh, near to hear somebody mention, I forget who it was exactly, I think it was down in the States. Bill, you mentioned it. My, my ears perked up, and I'm thinking, man, that sounds great. 200, excuse me, 200 foot buffers, riparian buffers. I have to do the conversion, because I've been up here long enough. But still, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill, 60 meters, you got that right. Well, guess what? We don't quite have that in many of our systems. But that's something that is to strive for. When you look at all these factors that we say are so fundamentally important and we want to protect and we want to restore, well, I think Dave Derrick said it yesterday several times and it's been mentioned today. If we can protect what we have, then we're far better off. And it forms those natural templates against which we can look and establish our restore and habitat. So I'm going to have to pick it up here. I apologize. So lessons learned through a fisheries lens. That integrating historic knowledge and experience is required to meet emergent ecological pressures and challenges. Why I want to emphasize this, I know it sounds very basic, but it's the magnitude, scale, and rate of change that our landscapes are facing is unprecedented. And it is not stopping. So what we want to try and do is recognize that. It's a function. Of, and I hope it's the next one, there we go. Integrating restorative actions with land use planning, development, standards, and practices. Aligning our anthropogenic interventions, including restoration, to conserve, enhance, and better emulate the natural processes and ecosystem functions that we see in that landscape. It is doable, it's not easy, but it is doable. We need to emphasize and account for the dynamic nature of both the physical processes and the biological response towards setting realistic objectives and managing social expectations. Let me say that again. Managing social expectations. And I, the reason I emphasize that on the fisheries end is because I've seen far too many times where certain metrics are used and they say, well, you got 10 kilometers of stream here, looks pretty good, and from our photos, we suspect that based on that, that should support X number of pairs of spawning salmon. And therefore, they're going to produce this many eggs, and that's called a biostandard, by the way, and we're going to produce this many fish. Well, I wish, again, it were that easy. It is not that easy, and for many, many reasons. And we just simply need to be more realistic when we're communicating with our community interests. It's better for you, it's better for us, it's better for society. Additional lessons learned to emphasize and advance a holistic, ecological-based approach or perspective that focuses on systemic root causes. I'm going to tell you that my 20 years experience plus in dealing with the regulatory end and looking at land use practices on the federal side has armed me well for my perspective in looking at resource restoration options. And I'll tell you right now, I am personally and professionally challenged to try and undertake restorative actions in a watershed when I know that development is moving forward. Not that that's a bad thing, but that the manner in which that may be undertaken that is affecting the very things we are spending public funds on to try and restore. This is very important. i got to just quickly say, Dave, Eric the other day was showing a, an example of some of the good restoration work they were doing down there. It was brilliant. He's going on. He's on video hands waving, kind of like myself, so I appreciate that. But uh, he's going on, and as he's doing that, he's, going, he's, he's, he's talking about replanting, repairing veg. This is great stuff. You only got two thumbs up. As he's doing that, in the background, you hear a chainsaw, and off goes this log, this big tree, not log, that crashes into the ground, was completely unassociated with their restorative efforts. This was right across the stream. So that's just an acute illustration of sometimes where does the right hand know what the left is doing. Emphasizing the importance and benefits of an enhanced and professional 
transdisciplinary approach. We've got that in this room. There's a multitude of disciplines. It is no longer really acceptable, much like the paradigm that Kim aspires to when he says, hey, we have civil engineers that have their focus way too narrow. Well, guess what? We have a biological focus fundamentally as well that has been far too narrow. And when we undertake restorative actions, I can't do that as a biologist. There's a lot of things I know. But I gotta call my buddy Neil, as unfortunate as that is. I gotta call on him for his discipline and understanding. I gotta call for on geotechnical support, a geomorphologist, to contextualize what we want to do to address those limiting factors. We need to look to broaden our social and community awareness and support through a focus on ecosystem functions and services, perhaps linked to natural capital assets valuation. Why? Again, to move beyond the traditional boundaries of those in the room. You guys are doing fantastic work. Fantastic work. But we need to expand. One of the commonalities that I hear in our community advisors here, in terms of working with the conservation community, is we're not getting any younger. We're not getting any younger. And everybody looks around and says, geez, you know. We need, yes, we have school programs. Dorothy, uh, where are you? You mentioned the program you're in. There's many that are involved and the education programs for Sam and Samanas in the classroom, absolutely brilliant. And we need that, we need to maintain that, but we gotta go beyond that. We gotta go beyond that. We need to recognize the importance of accounting for uncertainty to acknowledging what we do not know. Neil mentioned this a bit earlier. And the variability in what we do know. Both these are controlling variables in terms of producing something that is meaningful on the landscape that's gonna do a, be of some benefit over time, not one or two years, not a simple salmon cycle of, of three to four years, but for a much longer period of time, appreciating the dynamic state. And that includes, uh, that links into both our planning, our outcomes and expectations that we set. Boy, I know the bonds are gonna come out here very quickly. I think we need to ask ourselves, this is gonna be a shocker to some, but I think we need to ask ourselves whether it is realistic I'm going to go so far as to say responsible to promote the notion that we have the capability to restore degraded watersheds to some predisturbed baseline condition or state, along with a corresponding response in terms of the biological community. Now why I say that is because we're not, we're not coming in at time zero. In many of these systems, are, these watersheds have faced challenges. In many cases and instances, we're not even aware to what degree these systems have been impacted. So we're not coming in at ground zero. We're coming in down the road. There's already been a lot of impacts on these systems. And our ability to fundamentally restore to some population level, some biophysical level, is gone. You've got to be truthful. So now you have to set a new paradigm. What is, what is possible within this watershed in striking that balance? We need to revise our messaging once again and, ex and according to expectations around watershed restoration goals is linked to some theoretical pre-disturbance baseline condition. And that, and, these, and, and that statement considers some of these points. Continued population growth and land and resource use pressures with emphasis on water. That's just what we were hearing from Ted speak earlier. The emphasis on water is going to grow. We all know that. But we need to be prepared for that. We need to consider that in terms of setting our expectations around fisheries production. The knowns and uncertainties around climate change. I think Sylvia and Neil mentioned this earlier, and the effects on ecological processes and systems. The scale and cumulative impacts or alterations of our watershed, as I mentioned earlier, that have already been underway. And the general limitations around the absence of baseline data upon which to reference or gauge the effectiveness of our restoration goals. And many times we don't even have access to basic information to really help inform how well we're doing. Where we do, we use it, and it's fantastic, and we use those as key reference points. But all too often, we don't have that information. It is a real challenge. It is also another reason to look at, I believe, ecological process-based based restoration. It's not a panacea. I'm not saying that in case somebody challenges me afterwards. I get it. There are no silver bullets, all these cliches you can think about. But it is important that we begin to look at the landscape level, otherwise we're fooling ourselves. 
So looking forward, we need to improve integration on land development status and trends and our restorative actions in terms of setting meaningful targets. You'll notice that land use and res restoration in the same sentence now. You follow what I mean? In the same sentence. It's a common theme. Emphasize or focus on natural process drivers and root causes and measures to assess trends to mitigate the find imbalances that we perceive within our landscapes or creek sheds. Perhaps based on some form of indices of ecosystem condition or state of impairment, and that's in part what the habitat status report under the wild salmon policy provides, we need to reevaluate recovery potential of targets, accounting for perennial land use pressures that will likely increase and the overarching uh, climate change influences. And once again, we need to establish realistic, meaningful, and preferably measurable expectations. Somebody mentioned that earlier about setting realis realistic objectives. I'm almost there. Hang with me. Just about there. We need to incorporate adaptive management approaches. Now, adaptive management is nothing new, but you know what? It eb ebbs and flows. I think of Kim's commentary this morning about the droughts and the floods. Well, guess what? Adaptive management clearly is one of those, but it is a critical one. All the science in the world won't help us inform and manage in the state of change that we're currently facing. So adaptive management principles are important, and that's where a lot of you, for the work that you've done over the years, is ever more important. We need to promote commonality of understanding. That's one of the key reasons we're here. On the condition and health of our watersheds, the concerns that individuals like yourselves have for their creek sheds, and the objectives, setting objectives, meaningful, realistic, achievable objectives as we look through time and as we consider potential climate change uncertainties. We need to seek to better understand, define, and incorporate attributes of ecological resilience, resilience into our restoration plan. Not site-specific one-offs. They're great, they're fine, they serve a purpose, but they're limited. We need to think bigger picture. We need to challenge ourselves across disciplines, across sectors. And we need to incorporate that in our restoration planning in context with anthropogenic disturbance and climate change influences. And further than that, to define specific actions that can foster ecological resilience at an ecosystem or creek shed scale. So, to better, oh, and finally, to better consider Logistical issues. Now, this is a non-technical one, but logistical issues that can compose that can impose real constraints and obstacles to achieving our ecological restoration goals and targets. This is very critical. Far too often, we get all excited. The programs come in, the money rolls, everybody's all wound up. Off we go in the field. We we build it. They will come, kind of consideration, and yet then we start to think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's some, there's some potential constraints here. Well, what are they? Well, there are a multitude of things. Legislative, regulatory, and policy change. And that happens all the time. Whether it be local government, whether it be the provincial or federal government. Social and public support for dedicated or accelerated recovery efforts. Just because everybody in this room is two thumbs up about, about restorative recovery within their creek sheds, maybe that's not shared by some of your neighbors. Maybe that's not shared by others within your community, which is again why we need to outreach. Water licensing, land tenure agreements, and ownership issues. Boy, if you think we've had a challenge to date, just advance that another 10, 20, 30 plus years. It will not get any better on that front. So we need to be live to these issues as we look at restorative actions in our creek sheds. Operational maintenance and monitoring requirements and build structures. If you build a structure in the natural world, and it's supposed to work in a natural uh, function, that's great, but it's going to take maintenance. It's going to take monitoring over time to ensure that it's meeting its objectives and that it's staying functional. And guess what? This isn't viewed as being very whizzy uh, through governments. It's the initial upfront stuff that's really good and what they love to see. This remains a perennial challenge, and I can tell you right now, we know that firsthand. When we look back at our 40 plus years of evolution uh, within our, the federal side. And then financial support for ongoing operations and maintenance. Finances is always a key aspect. 
and that will never go away. But we've had a lot of programs. You see how they're coming externally now. It's almost like the Pineapple Express. You got one coming in after another, and in they come, and we respond to it. Well, that's great, but at the same token, we need to look longer term from a financial sense in terms of maintaining these structures and their value. So, quick summary of action and one more slide. Integrated strategy for connecting land and resource use to restorative targets. I've said this probably four times now in this presentation. And I'm going to argue, and I'm going to be right up front, that it shows arguably perhaps the bias of where I've been in the department and where I am in the department right now. But it is an undeniable truth. How we get there, yes, is going to remain a challenge. But that's a challenge for me in the nature of my work. It's a challenge to my colleagues, and it's a challenge to all of you in this room. We need to adopt a more integrative and holistic strategy or approach. Now, that sounds like a grandiose strategy and idea. And we've been looking at this and saying this for 30, 40 years. I get it. I get it. But it hasn't gone away. You can't step back from that. It is now arguably every more fundamental. And one of the key reasons that is, I might add, is because have you noticed that governments now, in terms of dealing with all the issues that it feels it needs to on behalf of the public, is looking at a program delivery through an external lens. So that means that means government, that's why you only have two folks looking at, you know, a quarter of the province. For the province of British Columbia, I don't want to speak for them, but that's arguably one of the reasons. People say, well, we need more boots on the ground. Well, guess what? Tag, you're it. That's why you're here. That's what you're doing. That's why you're involved. That's why you care. And you can make that change. Need to re-engage and elevate the dialogue across sectors. And I mean governments. I mean any entities. And we were beginning to do that towards the end of Sylvia and Neil's presentation. I, you could just, you could feel, right? You could feel that angst kind of coming up. Well, what about this? This all sounds wonderful, but hey, where's the money? Is the check in the mail? So it's important to understand that. And we need to elevate that communication and dialogue. And I say that full well knowing where I stand and where I sit within my own organization. Need for improves and sustained partnerships and coordination. That's very similar to the third bullet. But on this one is looking at ways to foster those partnerships for the long term. Not just on, on, on a program level, but longer term. Why? Because our communities aren't going anywhere. Our creek ships aren't going anywhere. The issues aren't going to go away. So we need to establish longer-term partnerships. And that means looking at ways for how we undertake restorative development. We need to reconsider our management and social expectations. I mentioned this several times because I think that's fundamentally important. With realistic and achievable goals and expectations. And we need to adopt. This is a hard one. This is a hard one. We need to adopt a longer-term perspective thoughtfulness in our approach and how we undertake our, our work and perseverance. As Kim alluded to, you know, God bless him and many others in this room that have been at this now for 40 plus years, and I sincerely mean that. That's kind of the way that I'm feeling these days, to be completely honest with you. I look back on a career, and I think, where have we come? It's daunting sometimes, and I think we all feel that way. But it is the long game. You know, it's 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 a longer race, so you gotta pace yourself. You gotta pace yourself. I smile when I say that because my manager's here and I say that all the time, so he hears it. So I'm gonna leave you with this. This is a reflection of not only my experience within the restoration side and thinking about the aspects of restoration. It's it's a question that I raise in the context of why we're here. It's a question that I raise in terms of the work that I've done over the years. And it's a reflection on, on what are very severe challenges to what we face to try and sometimes seem like, did we advance the ball? I know we didn't get a touchdown. I think we kicked, tried to kick a field goal and, and, and a field goal and it bounced off the upright. But did we advance a yard or two? So the question is, with a premise, Considering the current climate, and if you'll allow me to punt for a moment, but I do think it's ever more germane when you hear about the rate of global warming, 
specific reference to Canada warming at a rate of two times faster than any other country in the world. When we look at some of the challenges that are posed by the hydro statement, which is a reflection of the continuation of the history we're going, considering the current climate, and you don't have to answer this, I just want you to think about it, and, and carry this forward to the presentation this evening that Storm will be delivering, as well as into tomorrow. Are there opportunities to foster fundamental institutional change? institutional change in our approach to ecological restoration to better align land and resource use planning with restorative actions and goals that sustain core ecological values and services. I think it's a critical question. I think it's time we think bigger picture. We need to. You don't throw away everything, the good stuff that we've developed over the years. We carry that forward. But the rate of change demands this of us. So I'll leave that with you. The final slide is just thanking all the, uh, the sponsors and supporters of this symposia. Uh, and I'd just like to, to thank uh, the local first uh, indigenous communities to, for supporting us on their traditional unceded uh, territories. Partnership for Water Sustainability and Planning Committee, they've been a great team to work with. Absolutely fantastic. The Mid Vancouver Island Enhancement Society for their graciousness and support yesterday, today, and through this symposium. You folks have been absolutely wonderful, and Pete Wall and, and, and others. Our sponsor symposium, our, our symposium sponsors mentioned earlier, our presenters, local, and I'd say our neighbors from the south. And I look at that because it's always good to have both the internal look or perspective, but also perspective from outside helping you think about your environment and how it relates to others. And then yourselves for your interest and engagement within this workshop. It's really appreciated. It's, it's heartening, actually, to see this many people here, and I've taken up far more of your time, and I very much respect and appreciate that, but it's important. So your, your participation. I just want to say a special thanks to Kim Stephen. Uh, I mean, it's been said before, Richard mentioned it uh, earlier, but in terms of my engagement and participation, I don't know how I got roped into this, but I'm very glad that I did and very appreciative of the entire planning committee and Kim in particular. He is an amazing individual. You are a real inspiration, buddy, and I say that from my heart to I just thank you all very much. Thank you for indulging me. Okay, very quickly, look at the room, still full, this is great. This morning, just to wrap things up quickly, we heard from Paul Chapman, the Nanaimo Area Land Trust. We heard about the collaboration and the success stories that they're working through with that group. Bill Derry then came up and re reminded us about the science behind the changes on the land that can actually affect health and life in our creeks, really, really important. After lunch, Pete Law and his group came up here. We had representatives and panelists talking, and on behalf of the stewardship group, the forestry group, surface water, the balance between providing drinking water and providing flow for fish. Kim talked about the hard work of hope. Quick story about the hard work of hope. We have a debris basin on one of our creeks in North Van. Normally we clean that debris basin out every four years with about 60 truckloads of material. This year, November 2nd and then November 4th, we had to clean that basin out twice, immediately one after another with over 300 loads of material. So it's just a little bit, that's what we're facing and we got to do it together. Neil and Sylvia came up, talked about the groundwater and the importance of surface water. What I really thought was important and impressed me a lot about them is, is they came forward and in a humble way here expressed and admitted their limitations and asked for help. We heard 
Nick Leone come up and tell us that restoration is important because this is not a 100 meter sprint, but this is a long, enduring event and we're going to get there together and we're going to make some great things happen, I can tell. So that's going to end our day. I want to remind people that Storm Cunningham is going to present tonight. The doors will open at 6.30. We expect you to show up at 6.30, have a chance to meet someone who you might have not had a chance to meet and talk with, and then the presentation will start at 7. Thank you everyone for being patient and for a good day.